Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 824, with today's guest, Sensei Aaron Hoops. I had a great time with this one. I think you will, too. Stick around. Hey, if you don't know who I am, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I host Martial Arts Radio. I founded Whistlekick. I'm a passionate traditional martial artist. I love martial arts. And that's why we do so many different things at Whistlekick, because I want to do different things, because I love traditional martial arts in all of its forms. And I wanted to start a company that was dedicated to getting more people to train. And you can see that in the things that we do. We connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world in an effort to get everyone in the world to train for just six months. We're making headway, and we appreciate all of your assistance to that end. If you want to help us, there are a number of things you could do. You could check out the things that we do. This podcast, for example, share it with a friend, or maybe buy something at whistlekick.com. But you can also support our sponsors. They go a long way to helping us grow and increase reach and pay the bills. Today's episode is sponsored by Safest Family on the Block. If you've been around a little while, you may know the name Jason Brick. He's been a great friend of the show, a great friend to me personally. I really appreciate him. But he's doing some really cool stuff with Safest Family on the Block, which is a podcast that brings together kind of all of Jason's areas of knowledge, uh, martial arts, of course, first and foremost, but also journalism and something he's really passionate about, parenting and helping parents gain additional resources. You know, he, he interviews some incredible people on his show about everything from self-defense and crime prevention, but also driving safety and emergency preparedness and mental health and all the sorts of things that are relevant in today's world regarding families. So I hope you do check out the show. It's a wonderful show. I've been on it and I really appreciate Jason's support of Martial Arts Radio. Now, there's also a book. Jason put together a book kind of following along with the podcast and it's 101 tips, tricks, hacks to make your family safer. Right? There are a lot of things we talk about stuff like this on the show. So if you dig what we do, you're probably going to dig this show, but also this book. And I hope that you'll check it out because Jason's giving a discount of 25% to all martial arts radio listeners. Use the code WHISTLEKICK23. That's one word. Hopefully you know how to spell WHISTLEKICK. WHISTLEKICK23. And you can find Safest Family on the Block on Instagram and on Facebook, or you can follow the links in the show notes. I think that's a great place to wrap the intro, because what we're going to talk about in my episode today with Sensei Aaron is another way of looking at family. I'm not going to spoil anything by saying more, but I think the there's some synergy here, and I appreciate when that happens. Synchronicity, if you will. My conversation with Sensei Aaron Hoops. Hello. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. You too. You know, it's it's been what? When did when did I see you? Six weeks ago, something like that. Yeah, about. Yeah, what's been going on since? Uh, what's happened just for you dive, in the last six weeks. Yeah, diving into um sort of summer stuff, getting the gardens going. I, ha I have a big homestead, so I do a lot of um, gardening and growing oh, cool. food. Uh, getting my classes going, the kids' classes. Um, we're outside now. Cool lots of lots of stuff <laughs> lots of stuff yeah this is summer in vermont isn't it it's, it is yeah you, you gotta you gotta flip that switch and you gotta dive right in literally just before i came on to talk to you i was out pulling some uh last year's uh, drew some artichoke canes out you know just like old stuff that had died just to give the new stuff some room it's it's constant, it's constant. yeah i have i've got a lot of gardens <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i i uh I finished up. I've got, I think, about 60 feet of raised bed done for the year. I just, and now I need to move on to the next. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I grow a lot of food too. Maybe, probably not as much as you, but. Well, I've, I've, I, I, I tend to grow certain things a lot of, and then I have a lot of um, fruit trees and mm. fruit bushes and various things like that that yeah. take up a lot of space. And need Did your trees food. get hit with the frost? You're. I lost, I lost okay. maybe three or four grapevines and okay. one apple tree that was okay. really young, but the rest is all fine. We didn't oh, even good. have frost on the ground. so. Oh, good. 
Yeah. I'm up high enough. I'm like 1800. So. Okay. I, I'm because I've spent a little bit of time with you. I'm going to guess that these two things connect martial arts and gardening for you. you tie together. <laughs> well, there's an old saying, how does it go? Um, I'd rather be uh, a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Is that's, gardening something that's always been there for you or is that probably in the that? last 15 years I've, I've, gotten really into it once i i like i like healthy food i like good organic you know food that's not got all sorts of stuff in it and so i tend to try and grow a lot of things that i like to eat a lot of onions potatoes fruit um you know lettuce kale spinach yeah. peppers all that kind of stuff right on so and and I just I, I love the the whole aspect of caring for the plants. I mean, I'm, my whole thing is about connecting to nature and and you build relationships with the plants and um, feel the energy. So that's really yeah I get for it. for sure. You mentioned getting kids classes going and they're outside. You know, I suspect we've got some instructors who heard that and just thought, oh my god, kids outside. Keeping them focused can be tough uh yeah at times depending on what's going on like right now they're just finishing um the school year is about to end and so they can be a little all over the place but i just got these i just found out about them they're um reusable water balloons that you fill up and you throw them they splatter and then you fill them up again they have a little magnetic thing or oh, something no way. To them together and so we're gonna have this big water balloon fight with them oh that sounds great that sounds yeah like it's good um but yeah i've i've you know i've had this kids this kids martial arts school going for probably 12 years now or so mm. and um a lot of it's outside as much as possible is outside i have a i have a dojo mm. in the house in the barn but um we try to be outside as much as possible unless it's winter speak to that more Would it sounds like that's important so if it's important there's a reason well it, it's very important i think you know i mean when having kids outside in their bare feet running around on the grass is just you know that's that's the ideal you know kids need to be out outside they need to have their feet on the ground and then you know teaching them whatever they can do to move and stretch and breathe um is really a a, a an amazing thing to introduce i mean it's sad you have to even say that we're introducing it into their lives they should have it everywhere in their lives all the time but they don't nowadays yeah. um so getting that getting them to be you know comfortable with that and and loving that is is huge for them mm. and you see it you see it in their development as they grow up and and you know they've spent their life being outdoors and climbing trees. And, you know, we, I, I teach them how to climb rocks. I teach them how to build fires. I teach them how to, you know, just spend time outdoors doing, doing adventure type uh, experiences. Mm. So it, it sounds like it's martial arts plus. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it we, we, we bow okay. when we bow when we start, we stretch out, we breathe, we do some kihon, which is some basic techniques. Then we usually do some kata. Then we, it, depending on what the day is like, we'll climb a mountain or, you know, run around in the woods in the winters. You know, if it's, if there's a lot of snow, I'll send, sometimes I'll send a couple of them out and then the others will have to follow their trail to to try and catch them so it's you know it's sort of tracking and ninja work and you know kind of fun fun stuff oh, like they, that. they must they must love that they do they do oh, it's, that's great yeah, it's a good you time. said 12 years you've been doing that for 12 years i bet you've you've had some kids with you for at least a good chunk of that i have i had watch their development last year i actually had three that made it all the way to black belt they've been with me cool. for 10, 11 years, um, started when they were six and seven. And now they're the, the oldest one is 18. Um, and still comes, he's now helping me train the littler kids. Um, so they're, 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 you know, they get, it's, it helps them establish who they are and, um, give them a lot of confidence in their life.
I bet you get feedback from parents and probably different feedback from parents than maybe some school owners are used to because you're yes. adding some of these other elements. Yes. Well, I, I you know, I, I, parents are always kind of going to gush about how happy they are with their kids, you know, and, yeah. and proud of their kids. And so, yeah, they, they, they do see the benefits of, you know, how these kids start to, um, you know, there's, there's certain, there's certain aspects that you teach them, you know, like kindness and generosity. And I have this whole set of precepts that they have to repeat, you know, they, they, they learn the dojo kun, which is, you know, your martial arts dojo kun, but also sort of these seven words like kindness and generosity and respect and honesty and integrity and, and what is that and sometimes I have them write reports on it you know there's it's it it is martial arts plus because I I do a lot of other things besides just the physical aspect of it mm. over the course of the 12 years that you've been doing this have you always incorporated these extra things these plus things like building fires or is that stuff you've added over time so originally it started as a as a martial arts class with I, I started actually going to a few schools and um doing kind of introductory classes um sort of at the end of at end of the school day with a lot of like waldorf schools and um alternative schools and those children got interested in it and started coming to my my place up here and it kind of evolved from that. And, you know, after a while, it, it, the, the kids want, you know, they, they, you know, if they come one day and they're all kind of bouncing off the walls, you, you can't just sort of sit them and make them do punches and kicks. So you get them to do something different. And so we'll take a hike in the woods or we'll, you know, do stuff different. And then it, it, it really just started evolving into other things. Um, in, into creating sort of a like the the whole land up here now has trails and you know um tree houses and special you know rock ledges that mm. they climb and all sorts of things up here that that you know we just go out and explore and and make up make up games or make up um things to do with them and uh it it, it just becomes its own thing it's 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 evolved a lot since the beginning um it, it, that's really cool. You know, one of the things that I, I've had conversations with a number of martial arts instructors about, especially those who are very beholden to the old ways of training, you know, we talk about how those don't always scale down to younger kids. And that if you, as you said, if they come in and, you know, anybody who teaches kids knows that they act differently during a full moon, right? So <laughs> if you have a full moon class and they're bouncing off the walls, you can try to put the square peg in the round hole, but you do that too many times, they're not coming back. And if they're right. not there, you can't help them. I know you come from a rather traditional background. Did you have a hard time letting go of some of that? Uh, not really, I just adapted. It was, um, you know, I still keep a structure. There, mm. there, There's a structure of the class. They, they come to class, they have to line up, we kneel down, we bow. We, we stretch and then, you know, depending on where things are, we, we do whatever we're going to do. At the end of class, we line up, we bow, we, they all say the dojo kun, they are actually learned it in Japanese and then they speak it in English and then we bow and there's, there's a structure and between the bows, the, the, the bowing in and the bowing out between that we're, you know, we're doing whatever we're going to do. Mm. And that may be playing, that may be whatever, but they, they see that structure. I, I feel they see that structure as an important aspect, even though it's not super, um, you know, traditional martial arts strict, there still is a structure that it's based around that, that they, that, that they know what they're getting when they coming to class. Sure. So it's not, you just show up and, oh, we're going to jump in the pond today, you know, but it's, it, there, there's a structure. And, and as long as we, adhere to that basic structure then we can you know branch out and do whatever whatever else we're going to do mm. you're calling it a structure the word that's coming to mind for me is more of a framework yeah framework you, you, framework you, works, you set sure. up these 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 i don't want to call them loose but flexible boundaries which you know of course we know kids need you know when we were working together if 
few weeks ago, you know, we talked a lot about my word for this parameters and it, mm. I'm hearing a lot of that in there. Cool. Uh, why not adults? Oh, uh, I do. Adults. I have, oh, okay. I have taught adults. I, I, when I lived in Burlington, I had a school I was teaching at UVM and um, I had a, a group of people that I took from white belt to black belt mm. um, in the five years that I was living up there. And I do, I, I actually just, uh, a, a guy just showed up and he's training with me now and I've got a couple other people who are going to join. So yeah, I, I oh, teach cool. adults. I've, I've, All right. It's mostly the children because, you know, the children have the time and they're open and they're, you know, they're kind of these open books ready to be, ready to be written. Um, adults have all sorts of stuff going on in their lives. I live out in the middle of nowhere where, you know, there's 400 people in my town and getting, you know, finding a group of people that can come to me regularly to train is, is a hard thing. I've, you know, I teach some Qigong, I teach some Tai Chi and, and just getting people to come all the way up here is, is always a, a challenge, mm. it's but it's mostly, the kids are mostly, you know, local kids who live in the general area. Sure. Sure. All right. Well, you, you've, you've thrown out a few things. You mentioned Qigong, and, and I know you have, uh, it's a Shotokan background as well. Uh, originally. Originally. And, yep. and I know you've done a number of other things. You know, this is, uh, I, I have a little bit more insight into you and what you've done than, than a lot of the guests that come on the show. But let's, you know, let's rewind tape. Let's go back to the beginning. And how'd you get started training? So uh, in the very beginning, I think I was maybe 10 years old living in Pittsburgh. Um, Vermont was our summer house, but we lived in Pittsburgh and I joined some some karate school that was on the main drag and um, I must have done it for, I don't know, a year or so. Mm -hmm. And I have a few memories of it. One of the big memories is they were playing the Doobie Brothers while everybody trained. So it was it must have been kind of a kind of a. <laughs> I'm not sure what that was like, but anyway, it kind of, I, I got exposed a little bit at 10 years old, but then I sure. stopped and then we moved to Vermont and then I, you know, I kind of went in various different directions until I got to college and I, I managed to get into a good college, but I was sort of on a borderline of, you know, going off the rails, mm -hmm. but I, I got into a good college and decided I really wanted to learn, get back into martial arts and learn something. And I went to Tulane in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And the local um, martial arts instructor who was teaching at the university to get students to come to his dojo was Takeyuki Mikami, who was one of the very first um, All Japan champions in the 60s. And he had been sent to the States to be one of the, um, the main instructors for um, the Japan Karate Association mm -hmm. in America. And so I started training with him and really just got inspired because um, it just, it was just exactly what I needed to get myself on track. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started, I started training at the school and then I went to his private dojo and started training and I was, you know, I ended up training all the time. And one of his students um, was a fourth degree who was um, Chen Lam, who is a, a Chinese, um, Tai Chi master and he had his own school, but he was learning Shotokan at the same time. And I got to be friends with him and just started learning Tai Chi from him as well. So I was doing Shotokan and Tai Chi sort of every other day, Shotokan three or four days a week and Tai Chi a couple of days a week. And so I, I got this sort of balance or, or you know, something of, of both the hard style and the soft style right at the beginning. Contrast is the word coming to mind. Yes, the contrast of, of the hard style and the soft style right as I was starting. And mm. that was, I, I, I really, I really attribute a lot of my development to being able to, you know, get that hard stuff, but also understand the, the soft flowing stuff as well. Mm. It's and, so uncommon, right? Because you're, you're a college kid and college kids usually don't want the soft yeah. stuff. Right. So not only are you getting it, you're getting it in balance at, you know, most people that we've had on the show that have fallen into, I shouldn't say fallen into, but ended up with some manner of, of Tai Chi, et cetera. It's decades later. And it often comes because they recognize a contrast between what their body can do and what it 
used to be able to do. Exactly. Exactly. But you have these these two very significant and different roots. So continue. Well, so yeah, I I I thought it was just kind of normal. I was I I I you know, when when people start the martial arts, they kind of dive in head first or you know if you really get into the martial arts you start reading everything you can and learning everything you can and so i was i was in that state of just trying to soak up as much as i could and the tai chi was you know he chen lam was really into um like pushing hands and and learning the flow and and he he incorporated you know various different some even some weapons some some very some sword stuff different things like that and it all was just exactly what i was fascinated by mm -hmm. and i like i said i would i really i could you know if i hadn't have found the martial arts i could have gone you know off the rails because i was at that you know point in life where you know it's like what am i going to do what am i doing who am i all this kind of stuff and I really found myself grounded in it and, and able to, to, you know, accomplish and, and gain something. And I, I picked it up. I picked up the martial arts rather quickly. I, I advanced rather quickly at, at that stage. And I found myself um, getting into all sorts of things that were related to Japan. Like Sensei Mikami couldn't really speak English. And mm -hmm. so... I started learning Japanese and um, with another friend of mine who was at the university, we convinced one of the professors there to be our um, to be our our guide and and um, allow us to design our own major. So we mm -hmm. brought in a Japanese language teacher and um, started studying Japanese history, Japanese culture and, and the language. And by the time I graduated, I, you know, I could speak some. And it just became the, it just, it was just like, okay, what's the next step? Well, I'll go to Japan. And so, um, you know, I came back here for the summer and then, you know, September rolled around and I was off to Japan and, uh, I was, I what stayed. What did your parents and, think about that? They were, they were great. My, my father was actually, um, one of the founders of the intercultural communications field. Mm -hmm. And so he was all about, you know, foreign languages and, and, learning about other cultures and this and that and so they were very very supportive uh, um of me going overseas and learning about other cultures and and so yeah that that they were they, i you know it was wonderful and there was no pressure to you know you know get into the mainstream of business or law or whatever all that kind of stuff so it was perfect and uh yeah, I went to Japan. I I didn't leave the country for three, three and a half years. And when I got there, um, I had to get a cultural visa for learning karate. Mm. And so I got this visa from the JKA, the Japan Karate Association. Um, but in order to maintain the visa, you have to train four hours a day, six days a week. And so wow. I was, yeah, I was like full on every day like hardcore that's a lot and there was a group of us um there was a, a, a pretty strong group of foreigners this was in the the mid 80s and there were a, a good group of foreigners there but the japanese you know the japanese were the japanese and they they didn't especially like the foreigners coming and trying to appropriate their their martial arts or whatever so there was a lot of head hunting you got beat up i don't think you know a, a week did not go by without a black eye or a bloody nose or a busted mm. lip and bruises up and down your arms and legs you know that was just kind of standard stuff um other you know there were some serious injuries as well <laughs> um where was your your mindset at that point was it was it was it worth it? If you stayed there, it must have been worth it. But did it give you doubts? No, I was all in. You know, I got my black, I got my first degree before I left from Mikami. And then I, I got there, um, I got to Japan and trained pretty hard for like, it must have been two years. And then um, are you aware of like the Shotokan um, sort of lineage? 
So a, a bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in college, Jichin I, Funakoshi, I, earned a, I earned a brown belt. Jichin Funakoshi was the originator of modern day karate. He he came from he went to Japan and learned or went to China and learned karate or kung fu there and came back and turned it into karate. And he had two students, Nakayama and Nishiyama. And when Funakoshi died, Nakayama and Nishiyama split. And Nakayama became the head of the Japan Karate Association in Japan. And I was able to train with him in Japan um, during my time there. And I actually got my, my second degree with him. And wow. virtually, I don't know, it, it may have been a month or two months after that he died. Um, and I had this really weird experience. I'd trained in the morning and I was riding the train home and all of a sudden I got this horrible, just really just dark down, horrible feeling. And I learned later that that's when he had died. So mm. it was kind of strange. Did, did you, did you have a strong connection with him? Um, you know, I was, I, I don't, I don't know how much he considered you know, he had lots and lots of students and lots of foreign students, and I couldn't speak very well at that point to him. Um, but I had I had some kind of relationship with him, sure. And went to his funeral. There were probably I don't know five thousand people at his funeral, and we had to sit in Cezar for six hours, which yeah did a number on my knees. <laughs> that, that's you know what if there's nothing I can imagine more Shotokan than a Shotokan funeral. <laughs> where everybody sits in a grueling position for six hours. That's the most <laughs> Shotokan thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. If, if it was, was a Kyokushin the... funeral, it, you know, oh, I'm the, sure. six, the six hours would involve getting hit with a Shanai while you're, while you're doing it. <laughs> yep. 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 Um, so yeah. And, and um, then, uh, then after he died, there was, there was sort of a, I felt like it was sort of a, um, there was a period of time where everybody was just sort of like, what are we doing? What's going on? And things continued. And I, I, I was training at Nakayama's private dojo um, called the Hoitsugan, which was being, the classes were being taught by um, Kawawada, who was one of the, uh, one of the main instructors there. And that was a group of, um, that was a group of us foreigners, you know, from Germany and Chile and uh, the U.S. and Canada and a bunch of different places. And we had a really strong group and, you know, we, we went to the all Japan championships and went to the all Tokyo's and I think, I don't know, we might've gotten second place or something in the all Tokyo's and it was a really strong core group of people. Um, but then by about 89, um, the rift was really starting to grow and, and the, the two factions that had broken off, broken apart from each other, just got really political and you couldn't train with these guys if you were training with these guys. And, and I, I, I was really not into the politics. What, what was the heart of the rift? I've heard people say, but you, you, you were closer to it than anybody I've talked to. Well, they just, they, you know, the two sides wanted to be the, the big cheeses. And, um, you know, I, they, it, it was interesting because there were guys I liked on both sides and I wanted to train with them. I just, I was just into training. And I didn't want to like get all caught up in that po political stuff. And um, it kind of soured me on things. I also got a, a pretty bad injury and um, just sort of felt like my time, um, my time was coming to an end. So um, I, I wound things up and ended up coming back here. And it was interesting, you know, I got back here and everybody I'd known in college and stuff had gone on to business school and law school and they were all, you know, caught up in the whole rat race thing. And I just couldn't relate to it. So I, um, I started, I started writing books and teaching karate and sort of making my way mm. through things. Okay. And talk, talk about the books, you know, anybody who's written a book knows that, you don't just, oh, I'm just going to write a book, right? Like, <laughs> writing a book is is a tremendous amount of work. And, you know, if I'm doing my math right, this is long before self-publishing. Right. Well, fortunately, my father, he he um, 
he had a publishing company called the Intercultural Press, which was oh, cool. which was a, books about um, intercultural communications. Mm -hmm. And it just happened at that time that they needed someone to, they were doing a series of books on how to go and live in different countries. Oh, and he was like, well, why don't you write the book on how to go and live in Japan? And so that became, that, that was the first book I wrote. Oh, nice. Did you enjoy that process? Yeah, that was, that, I liked that. I'd, I'd worked as an editor for some of his other books um, at the company. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And I, mm -hmm. I did that and that, that went really well. And um, so I, you know, I had these dreams of writing books. And so I started, you know, started trying to do some of that. I wrote a lot of articles and various different things and nothing really, nothing really happened for quite a while. You know, this was the, this was probably 1990, 91. And I don't think my first book was published until like 2002. So it was like 10 years or wow. more that it took, or my second book, the, sure, sure. the first book was just kind of, was there but the second book was actually a real book that was really published by someone else kind of thing what was that book that was called perfecting ourselves coordinating body mind and spirit mm. sounds like, and like a lot of martial was, arts in that book there was there was some martial arts in that book it was and and it was really i mean it wasn't strictly a martial arts book but it was about the process of bringing these these parts of our body and our or, you know the bringing the body, mind, and spirit together into, you know, exercises and practices that we can do to help ourselves become better people. Um, and and it, it was really, you know, writing it was a real process for me too, to try and understand, okay, I have this body, what does this mean? How does this work? What does this do? And in my mind, how am I, what am I doing with all these thoughts and trying to understand that? And then what is that spiritual nature that exists that is beyond the body and the mind? Mm -hmm. And so that book was my, really my attempt at trying to understand it myself. Hmm. Okay. And so as you're going through, you know, I, I've written a couple of books. And I know they can be wonderful for thinking through things at a really deep level. And I'm going to guess that those books and, and those subjects were creeping back into your training and how you saw martial arts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Very much so. And um, about that time, I, um, I, I was living in Burlington and I, I was married to a Japanese woman and her parents were like, you guys live too far away. Why don't you come visit us? We're going to take a trip to Australia. Come visit us. And so we flew over to Australia and we had a grand old time over there. And while we're there, her parents are like, why don't you guys move to Australia? It'd be fun. We are close. And, and, and her father was like, a rich Japanese guy and he ran a trucking company and he was like, well, we'll help you out and this and that and whatever. And so we're like, all right, let's move to Australia. <laughs> Why not? It's something to do and yeah. it seems like an adventure. So we packed up and we moved to Australia. Where, where'd you move to? Uh, well, the first thing that happened is we, we had to get visas to go to Australia. And it turns out it, it was this long process. So we decided to fly to Japan and um, stay there while we got our visas together and we we were living in osaka and um like i don't know a week before we we're supposed to get our visas the kobe earthquake hit mm -hmm. and literally uh, you know five thousand people died the whole everything was turned upside down it was a complete huge huge disaster and it shut down everything so we couldn't get our visas and so we ended up spending six months in us in osaka mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, well, I'll get a job. I was an English teacher, a, a children's English teacher. Um, so I could teach, I could get a job pretty quickly there. And we found a nearby dojo and we started training there. And I started, it had been probably, I don't know, seven or eight years since I'd taken my Nidon test. And I go in there and I'm training with the guys and the guy's like, there's no way you're a Nidon. You got to take your test for sauna. And I was like, I don't really care. You know, I got it from Nakayama. It's not really a big deal to, to take another test. He's like, no, you got to do it. So, so I ended up taking this black belt test in Osaka and I was the only foreigner. And it was like the 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 local university had you know like 10 students who were all going for their first and second degrees 
And so the, you know, this whole line, this table with like five or six old Japanese guys are like, oh, well, let's let him fight all of them. So I had to end up fighting every single <laughs> one. Uh, and by the end, of course, you know, the last one is the, you know, the the star of the, the karate team. And he's, you know, it's like a movie years old. And I'm like, oh, my God, here we go again. And so I literally just it, I got into that no mind point where I, I it was like, it doesn't matter what happens. I'm just going to stand here. And if he steps there, you know, that would be great. And he stepped right there and I took him down and I hit him and it was just, and it was over. I looked up at the table. I was like, is that enough? <laughs> and so they're like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I love it. So then and, and, you know, and that was I got my son done and, and then we were off to Australia. So um we landed in brisbane ended up on the gold coast i got a job as a japanese speaking tour guide hmm. and spent you know the next six or seven years or five or six years um taking japanese tourists around the country just hmm. having a blast cool it was a lot of fun sounds like a lot of fun what was training like for you while you were in australia so in Australia, there was uh, I, I, I got in touch with some Shotokan people, but I also started meeting other people doing other things, which was really interesting. There was a Wing Chun school nearby mm -hmm. that I did some training there. And then I met this guy, um, wonderful guy, really good friend of mine who does um, who still does um, Tong Long Kung Fu, which is praying mantis. Mm -hmm. And um, we would spend hours and hours just like fighting each other and, and you know, sharing stuff. And, and we, en we ended up getting a whole group of um, martial artists that would get together, you know, a couple times a week up on the rooftop overlooking the ocean. Oh. And we'd, we'd all just sit and fight each other and, you know, exchange ideas about that martial sounds... arts. It's just it was fantastic. I, I didn't realize it until now, but that's one of my dreams. That sounds amazing. It is. It, I'm, I'm actually starting it here. <laughs> We're, we've got a whole bunch of people that are into pushing I, hands. And... I'm in. I'm in. Let me know when. <laughs> I'll let you know. When, when and where. Yeah, yeah. No um, ocean, though. There won't... Right. Well, no, we got the mountains. But... We do have the mountains. So, um, so I was doing that, and, and at that point, my, um, my marriage fell apart, and we got a divorce, and I was sort of like kind of kind of – you know, trying to figure things out. And I, I figured, I realized I really needed something that was going to um, get my head together. And I found the Australian Meditation Institute, which was um, right in the, on the Gold Coast nearby. And I went there and I met this woman who um, was the, the chief instructor. Her name was Shanti Gowans and she was maybe 65. Um, you know, every word that she spoke was just this magical sound and she floated when she walked into the room. I mean, she, she, her parents died when she was four and she was put into an Indian monastery. She's Indian. And so she was just this yogi. She really, she'd done yoga, yoga her whole life. And she had designed this whole, whole organization of the Australian Meditation Institute and Shanti Yoga. And I, I, I was at this point where I just did what I did when I got to, to college. I jumped into yoga and was doing it four hours a day, six days a week. I would, you know, I, um, fortunately, my job was like I could pick people up at six in the morning, take them to their hotel and be done and have the rest of the day free. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to do to go and, and jump into this this yoga training. And I did that for a number of years and eventually went through her teacher training and you know all this you know practice of of yoga and meditation and eventually got to the point where i'm like wait what if you put tai chi and qigong and breathing and all of this together with the yoga and you know make it into make it into a, an art in itself mm. And that's really where Zen yoga started, which is the the sort of the 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 training uh, modality that I've that I started called Zen yoga. Talk more about that. Well, I just I I I was just doing the yoga by itself. I I. I found that it needed it for me personally because I was I'd done so much martial arts that I needed more 
you know, I, I, the, the, the breathing and the stretching was great, but then I wanted to apply it to something. Mm -hmm. And so I started, I started turning it into a, an art, which, which it was, I call it the art of Zen yoga. And it's mm -hmm. really, it's really a, a, a martial art of yoga where, you know, you're doing the breathing, you're doing the movement, but you're also applying it to, to the movements and the forms and, and taking it sort of another the next step forward okay. um and i i got a contract to well let's see the perfecting ourselves the, 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 then i got a contract to write the book from a japanese publisher and so i started diving into creating a whole um zen yoga book yeah. um and i i really felt that you know australia was a beautiful place it, it was it was incredible and I, I would, I'd been working, I'd, I'd been doing the tour guiding, but then I got a job as a um, marketing director for a, a, a accommodation company. And we were building out this big, huge accommodation website where Japanese would be able to come and, you know, log on. And it was early days of the internet kind of thing. And um, we, my job was to drive around to different, um, holiday apartments all over Australia and test out the apartments to see what they were like and get the people who ran it to join our website. So it was just this great job of like traveling all over Australia and having fun and sounds terrible. <laughs> and so we we got this we we wrote this big huge business plan. We had these investors who were going to invest millions of dollars in setting the whole thing up and then 9/11 happened and everything shut down and the Japanese didn't even come to Australia much after that and and it was just like, oh, geez, you know, time to do something different. So and I had the book going. And so eventually I made my way back here um, in order to to get that on track and moving. Was that a difficult emotional process to come back here? Um, not not uh, to a degree, but the, the thing was, my parents, my parents were here. They were getting older and I did really feel like it was time to spend some quality time with them because they'd been so supportive my whole life. And so I wanted to I wanted to be able to come back and, and spend some time with them and, and take care of them, which I ended up doing, taking, you know, real care of them for the, the last years of both their lives. Um, so and and to be able to share, you know, the book, the book with them. And my dad was an editor. So he like he and my mom both were editors and they, you know, they read through every single page that I ever wrote and corrected it. And we discussed, you know, concepts and this and that. So it was really a great process to spend that time with them. So, you know, I, I, I went back and forth to Australia for a couple of years. I ended up being there for like nine years total. And that was that was a lot <laughs> for a long time. Um, and I think I, I would recommend to anybody to live overseas for a period of time, just be just so you get a view of the world from outside the sort of bubble that that we're encased in here. Mm. And there's there's a lot of other opinions. Yes, about things. <laughs> yes, that's a well said. <laughs> So here you are, you're back in the yeah. States and you've, you've written a number of books and, and you're, what I'm hearing is you are kind of molding this, this philosophy of what martial arts means to you in a rather broad, um, broad's not the right word, perhaps unconventional amalgamation. And I don't see that in a disrespectful way, because you know enough about me to know that I ha have similar but different views, right? Mine, mine is also an amalgamation. But what can be really difficult for someone with, with that view is how do you find people who are of like mind? How do you advance this when you've brought it together yourself? And I wonder if that created some challenges when you came back to the States and you're, you're figuring out what's next for training. So um, 
coming back here, I, I, you know, I, I, I was traveling a lot. I was, um, I was giving lectures and talks on breathing and talks on, on stretching and workshops. I was doing all these whole health expos and diabetes conferences and brain injury conferences. I, you know, I just traveled around bringing all my books and DVDs and CDs and, and all that and schlepping it around and selling it and giving talks. So I got really sort of focused on that for a while. Um, I think that for, for a period of time, I, I was, I was totally content just sort of, of promoting that and, and going for it. But at some point you get to this, like the, the whole self-promotion thing gets old after a while. And I, I got, I got quite tired of it and decided that's when I really started coming up here and, and getting into the gardens and starting to, you know, think about, think about other things like homesteading. What does that mean? And, um, obviously still continuing the martial arts. You know, I, I, I was teaching at Dartmouth for a while. I was teaching, um, a, a few other, you know, little schools and, and my own groups teaching the Tai Chi form to, you know, a group of people who would, wanted to learn and just that kind of thing. Um, but really, until I sort of, you know, I focused on the Zen yoga for a long time until it became part of me and, and, and became something that, you know, I, I can just talk about without even, without even thinking anymore, you know, how to breathe, why we breathe, what's the importance of breathing and, and how it affects the body and, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. The questions on this show don't really matter. Like I said, <laughs> just keeping you talking. We talk often on the show, and we talk often as martial artists about bringing martial arts out into the world. It's something we, we talk about, you know, almost constantly. And, you know, there's the the very clear example of self-defense and being prepared and watching the door and, you know, wearing clothes and shoes that, you know, you can defend yourself in, right? But as I get older, I find I'm much more interested in the other way, the way that, you know, it sounds like you were into at a very young age. How do I bring the rest of the world into my martial arts? How does my martial arts change, evolve, grow with me and continue to be the appropriate uh, support structure for where I'm at and where I'm trying to go in life. And, and what I'm hearing is, is that that's a, a strong thread for your story. So you're back here and you're teaching at Dartmouth and you've got these other schools, you know, that's quite a bit bigger than what it sounds like you were doing before. It sounds like before was, you know, I'm, you're, you're focused on, on one thing in one place, but it would, but it, it had some turnover, right? If you're going, if you're teaching and lecturing, you know, you're 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 all in with a group of people for a short period of time, and then you you disconnect and you go on to the next group. And there's a, there's an energy to that. And folks who have taught seminars, I've taught seminars. I know what that's like. It can be really intense and really rewarding. But you don't always get to help them move on. So is yeah it's 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 a total it's it's a different thing teaching just a group for a short period of time and then go to the next group and teach the same thing and then go to the next group and teach the same thing um you get really good at teaching the same thing over and over again but you it, it lacks some depth mm -hmm. um but i will say that while i was while i was teaching like that i was also doing some training i was learning um some some white crane uh qigong and kung fu and you know, a few a, a few other things that that were that I was maintaining my training with. Um, but what I've I, I think the way that it's evolved is what I found. And, and we we have a group called the Hoitsugan instructors. And um, these are all the foreigners who were training in Japan under Sensei Nakayama. Mm -hmm. And we actually put together two or three seminars out in California where the, we got together and we taught a whole camp worth of training in the traditional style of Nakayama. And what I, what I found is I brought a completely different kind of approach to, you know, everybody brought their own, their own thing to it. 
But what I'm what I found and what I've what I have found in in training with a lot of martial artists, not necessarily just traditional martial artists, but but even you know um, more modern styles, is that there's a lot of 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 focus on technique and stance and power generation and all of this kind of stuff but there's the the it seems that there's less focus on the things that i'm really focused on which are learning how to breathe properly and learning how to stretch properly because breathing and stretching it's not necessarily martial arts but it is what allows you to do your martial arts at the highest level and so my focus is on really trying to bring the the breath work which which is what i learned in yoga and qigong and the stretching which is also what i learned in the yoga to the martial artists so that they can then bring their martial arts to a higher level you know if it, it's it's all well and good to practice a thousand kicks but if you don't know how to stretch those muscles in a, in a way that is not going to hurt them, then you know your kicks your kicks are going to be whatever they are. But the the more that you internalize the this whole system of energy flow through the body, so the muscles are full of oxygen, so that they work properly, so the body works properly, the more the better your your martial arts is, is going to become. Makes sense. And so. Yeah, that's what I do now. I, you know, if I if I go to a, a martial arts clinic or school or whatever, I I teach the breathing, the stretching, and then once once we've done that, then okay, let's let's try this or let's do that or whatever to apply this and and notice the the changes that take place when you are are working with energy and working with your your body in that way. Mm -hmm. I suspect most people in the audience can understand the stretching part. Flexibility makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, maybe people are doing it for different reasons. You know, I think a lot of people stretch because they want to kick people in the head, right? You know, you're, you're not quite articulating that as the reason. But you know, I, th I think people can understand uh, injury reduction and a variety of other it, uh, Injury reduction is a huge one. That really is. I mean, the more... The more um, oxygenated and flexible and energized your muscles are the less chance they're going to rip or tear or strain or sprain or whatever right but what about the breathing side i think for most people breathing is a binary state you're breathing or you're not and if you're not <laughs> breathing you're going to start breathing very soon or you're never going to breathe again speak to which that. is okay and that that kind of breathing is what i call subsistence breathing that's 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 unconscious breathing where you breathe just enough to to maintain life you know you 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 watch people if you're standing next to them and you see their chest it goes up and down and up and down and and it's unconscious we don't have to think about it we don't have to do anything and and in fact if we had to think about it then we wouldn't survive very long because all the other thoughts would f make us forget to breathe but this unconscious breathing it it doesn't actually fulfill what 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 we could what we could become and so i call it subsistence breathing because it's just enough to keep the body functioning at its minimal level and most people are fine with that but if you understand how breathing works we we breathe in oxygen that's converted to energy that then flows through the body and when it flows through the body it, it collects the toxins and impurities and then we breathe that out as carbon dioxide so if if that's the case if the case is that we breathe in oxygen it turns to energy and then that energy cleans out and gets rid of the toxins and poisons wouldn't it make sense to maximize that process and so if we can learn to breathe deeper longer slower then we take in more oxygen which creates more energy which gets rid of more toxins and impurities out of the body and we we start to realize that we can live in this more energized activated state which is basically the principle of qigong which is about breathing and learning how to well 
let me correct that. I mean, that that's that's more advanced breathing. Sure. But once you're doing this more advanced breathing, you start to feel the energy flows and the Qigong is actually learning to cycle and circulate that energy through the various various vessels and meridians of the body so that that energy goes to everywhere that it needs. Okay. So again, with the, the, the contrast here, if someone wants to become more flexible, they know what to do to do that. Maybe they're not doing it, but they understand enough of the principles to know where they are versus where they want to be. And they can, they can probably self-direct that path, maybe, you know, source out some things, but the breathing as simple as subsistence breathing is, is I think for most of us far more complex because what do you mean there's a different way I can breathe? And okay, now, now I've heard, okay, now there's another way I can breathe, but where do I start? So given that the audience is primarily martial artists, what would you, where would you have them start on that journey if they so chose? Okay. Well, first let me, let me go back to something you just said about the stretching, okay. because here's the, here's the thing. If you learn to breathe properly and then, and this is basic yoga, if, if you've ever done any yoga, you go into a, a stretch, into whatever stretching position you're gonna go into and you hold that position and you breathe. Mm -hmm. And that breathing in that position sends that energy that you're generating to the part that's being stretched. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, if you can, migrate that to a martial arts setting if you can learn to breathe properly and you go into your martial arts stretching which are you know maybe maybe different from yoga stretches maybe not i mean i've i've created a lot of there's a, a eight thousand different yoga positions of stretching so that covers a lot um if you can add the breathing to the stretching then that's going to activate that process of the energy circulation in the body. And so, so it really starts with, with learning how to breathe consciously. And I, I think this is something that I started, oh, it must have been 30 plus years ago is when I realized how important breathing was and, and you know, the, the conscious breathing. Once you realize how important conscious breathing is and you learn how to do it, then it's just a matter of remembering to do it on a regular basis. And I think, you know, 30 years ago, I was like, wow, this is so important. I'm going to try and do it every day. And I may not have done it every single day, but I remembered like, oh, wait, I got to breathe and I'll do this breathing practice. And it's like, it's like putting a pebble in a jar. You know, you take a deep breath, you put a pebble in the jar. Next day, you take a deep breath, you put a pebble in the jar. You know, you got a couple pebbles in the jar. But after you practice this for weeks, for months, for years, you're filling up that jar. You know, it really starts to be something. And this is this is the same principles behind martial arts, same principles behind yoga, same principles behind Qigong. The more you practice, the more you effort and time you put into it. That's the whole meaning of Kung Fu is time and effort put into doing something. That is what creates that ability to to get the effects the be, the effects and benefits of it, mm -hmm. and so the learning how to breathe consciously, remembering to do it on a regular basis, that allows the process to to activate inside the body and get that energy moving, and it 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 takes longer than martial arts, honestly. You know, the qigong qigong is a is a, a 20 30 year practice until you're like wait a minute what's that energy i'm feeling you know it, it's it's it takes a long time to get there is it worth it absolutely absolutely and it's it's worth it because it, it enhances everything you do you now you learn to breathe properly and you add that to your martial arts that just you know then you then it it just takes it takes it to a whole nother level really So if people want to get started, you know, they're like, okay, I'm in, I get it. Where do they start? Where do you send them? Do they start with a book? Do they, do they have to seek out a person? Do you want them to go do yoga for a couple of years? Um, I, I, I would say just start breathing. I mean, <laughs> you know, okay. So you lie down on the ground, you put a book on your belly just below your navel. 
you lie down on the ground, you put a book on your navel and you close your eyes and you breathe in and you try and push that book up as you fill up your belly. So the, the, whole, the whole process is, is you want to engage the, the abdominal muscles so you're breathing down into the, to the abdomen. And what this does is this concentrates the breath in the lowest part of the lungs and, and the, you can take a deeper breath and fill the lungs up from the bottom. Most of us just breathe. You know, if you, if you take a moment to concentrate on your own breath, we're really just breathing with the top part of the lungs, very shallow. And so you, you, you learn to breathe down into the belly and expand by pushing those abdominal muscles out as you breathe in, filling up. And then you contract those muscles as you exhale. And it's really, it's really that simple. It's really learning to breathe with those abdominal muscles, using them to draw the breath deeper into the body and then using them to exhale and push it out. And we could go into 150 different practices. Oh, hold the breath for this long. Oh, hold the breath in, hold the breath out, circle it through, you know, do, do there's, there's plenty of, of exercises and practices to do. And, you know, I'm more than happy to, you know, teach that kind of thing. But it really starts with with doing the doing a deeper breath practice on your own for as as often as you can. Mm -hmm. okay. And then what happens is once you start doing that, you start saying, wait a minute, I'm, I'm feeling something. This is doing something. And then then sure, then you can start to explore, look for. Um, you know, I've written a book called Breathe Smart, and is, which is just about how to breathe properly. Um, it's it's part of zen yoga it's part of uh, numerous other um experts on breathing have written books on how to breathe you know there's it's it's not a complicated thing but it's something that that needs to be um recognized as as an important aspect of really everything it's not just a martial art thing you know breathing will enhance just about everything you try and do in your life even just plain your life <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things I've been working on is, you know, I, I deal with some anxiety stuff and it forces my breath shallow. And one of the easiest things I can do, it doesn't completely dismiss the anxious feelings, but if I can focus on my breath, it rounds off some of those corners. They're not quite so sharp. And then I can Absolutely. take some other actions. It's been, you know, that, that realization took me a very long time. And I, I, you know, I think in martial arts training, this is one of the one of the really most important things that's missed, mm. because we can train all we want in the dojo, but if you go out into the real world and you're confronted with someone acting aggressive towards you or acting aggressive towards someone else, the first very first most important thing to do is stop breathe, center yourself, and then decide how you're going to respond. Because if we just if we just respond off the top of our head, chances are that it's not may not be as well thought out as it should be mm -hmm. on Oh, what are the ramifications of me stepping in and punching this guy in the head or whatever it may be. If we stop and do that breathing that brings you back into your body to start with and and martial artists need to be centered in their body so that they can then decide how how to respond and react to whatever the the challenges that appear before them and so taking that deep breath taking that moment to say wait a minute i'm gonna be in myself before i just go off the handle that's that's a huge important part of martial arts and and i i i think that's probably one of the one of the most important you know we we as 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 people living in this society, and, and I'm, I'm talking about the majority of people, um, they live with this um, sympathetic nervous system activated all the time. And by sympathetic nervous system, it's this fight or flight mode. And the, the stresses and anxiety of daily life in the world cause us to sort of be in this in this in this state at all times and and what that does it's like it raises your blood pressure it makes your heart beat faster um it makes your adrenal glands secrete cortisol 
And it, it really is detrimental to relaxation and digestion and all these normal bodily processes that are supposed to keep us healthy and, and, and sane. Um, and so if we live in that, in that sort of heightened, heightened state and then something, something happens that puts us, that would normally take us from a relaxed state and put us into a heightened state of fight or flight. If we're already in that heightened state of fight or flight, first of all, everything causes more anxiety or stress. And if you get into a, an actual real situation where you're, where you need to be in a fight or flight mode, there's no contrast. There's no, there's, you're already there. So you're already wound up and then, Oh, something happened. I'm, it, how do you get more wound up? It's mm. just, it, it, it's just, it's terrible for the body. It's terrible for, for the situation. So the breathing takes us down into that parasympathetic nervous system, which is, which is all about relaxation. It's all about letting that stress go. It's all about reducing the anxiety, allowing the body to digest any food we've taken. It's really, it, it allows the, the levels of the adrenal cortisol to, to balance out. And so, so it's, it, as martial artists, it's, it's almost our responsibility to, I mean, if you're a traditional martial artist or, or any martial artist who follows, I, I call it the way, you know, the way of a real martial artist, you know, integrity, you know, nonviolence, respect, honor, truth, all of these, these aspects of what it really means to be a, a martial artist following the way, then it's kind of our responsibility to take care of ourselves so that we aren't just flying off the handle or aren't all wound up in tension and stress and anxiety um, when something comes along that we actually have to deal with. And so that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, what, what's next for you? What's, I missed that. What? What's next for you? What's coming? What's coming? Um, well, like I said, um, I'm I I've I I have a regular group of of guys that I hike with, and we've started pushing hands when we get to the top of the mountain, and and then I've got a, a number of other people. Some of my students have, are now you know grown up and going away to college, and 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 so I'm going to start up this um, adult push hands. Um, group where we we get together we breathe and stretch and then we start pushing each other around and and you know getting grounded and 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 it enables us to do you know physical work against each other without injury mm. without um a lot of ego without a lot of you know anything just just real good solid training um so that's that's a major thing i've got a couple new students who um starting to take things to another level um we're gonna i think we're gonna start a youtube channel of uh original forms that we've created nice. and um yeah i you know i've i've got this book that came out it, it's called reconnecting to the earth and um it, unfortunately it came out right like a month before covid hit oh. and so it kind of just got completely sidetracked and and i haven't really been able to get that back on track because now it's kind of too late but i still am a, a very uh into connecting to the earth and helping people find their connection to the natural world because you know we're we're in kind of a a, a state here um in our present day and the one thing that's really going to help help people get themselves relaxed and and feeling better about life is to get out in nature and and start to realize that we are connected to to everything on this planet and that's really what Taoism is all about it's you know the Tao is everything and we need to be in relationship with the plants and the animals and the trees it's not about you know it's not about taking advantage of them or exploiting them or or consuming them it's about a relationship with all these living beings that we exist on this planet with and i think we've pretty much lost that that concept at least in the mainstream and um it's it's not for our highest good i, I would agree i would agree with everything you just said there 
if people want to find these books or follow you, get in touch with you, anything like that, website, social media, what, what so um, I have reconnecting underscore to underscore the underscore earth mm -hmm. reconnecting to the earth on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I kind of get sick of social media. So I, you know, I, I don't post a whole lot sure. anymore. Um, I have art of Zen yoga.com, which mm -hmm. um, is all about my Zen yoga practice. And I think it has my um, Qigong class that I do online. And then reconnecting to the earth.com is, um, a, is the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and any, any contact us on those pages will come directly to me. So, um, I can think anybody can get in contact me, with me that way. I'm, you know, I travel and do, um, do some, like I, your, uh, all in weekend. That was fantastic. Really enjoyed doing that with you guys. Uh, hope to, hope to do some more with you. I've, okay, I've already, for sure. um, been over and seen Tommy a couple times. Oh, we're, great. we're doing stuff. He's going to come over here. We've been doing some some training together. Uh, for the audience, that's that's Tommy Given. I forget what episode number he was, but he's been on the show. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, I I you know I I feel like the state of the world is we're in a place where we need to um, kind of kind of get ourselves dial dial ourselves down and and take care of what's important um so i'm i'm focused on that you know community local community um food production various things like that 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 you know we're not going to change the one person isn't going to go out and and you know change all that's wrong in the world but we can we can work on our small little local place to get that going fully agree and and I, I I want to touch on this. This is like really an important point. I think we might have talked about this at the All In Weekend, but um, it's this idea of yin and yang. Um, and I think if you know the, the the concept of yin and yang, it's the it's the white and the black circle with the them flowing in each other. And the and the the yang um, basically uh, represents the 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 active, the, the expression, light, um, outward, outgoing, masculine. I don't necessarily want to use that word, but the, that, 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 and the yin is the receptive, the, the inward, the dark, the soft, hard and soft is probably the best, uh, internal is yin, soft is yin, hard, external is yang. And I think my my sense is that most of of us in the world have and, and the world itself is is a bit too much young right now. Everything is is hard and outward and rah rah loud and, and all this. And if you if you have studied the yin and the yang and the and the, the tai chi. The, you 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 don't want to be in yang all the time. It's really if it, it it's about a balance, and and when I say balance, I don't mean oh we have half yin and half yang because half yin and yang is is not really the answer. And and the best way this is the best um, explanation of that is is chocolate milk. So if I have a glass of milk, if I have say a whole cup of milk and a whole cup of chocolate and I pour that chocolate in the in the milk, it's just going to be a mess like pudding. OK, yeah. but if I have a glass of milk and I take a little bit of that chocolate and I put that in the milk and stir it up, then I have really nice chocolate milk. Mm. So if the yin, the soft is the milk. And the yang is this little bit of chocolate that you put in the milk, then you have very nice milk by putting just a little bit of yang, you don't need to put a whole huge amount equal to the milk, just a little bit. That's what the balance of yin and yang should be. And so we, we as martial artists, if we can stay in that yang place, which is, which is the receptive, which is the, the, the soft, the accepting, the, the, the gentle, it doesn't mean that we're weak, it doesn't mean that we we 
doesn't mean anything. It just means that we, we exist in that place. And then if you need yang, of course, we train, we're, we're martial artists. We know how to be yang, yang, kick, punch, whatever, you know, throws, takedowns, all of this. We know all that. We can be violent, but we, we live in the yin. And then if something comes along, it's like, oh, I need to be young right now. Then you let the young out in, in however, however much it needs to be let out. But it's not something that we live in all the time, just banging. You know, it's, it's that whole thing about, you know, if everything you see is an, if, you, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything you see is a nail. Well, hammer is young. And so we don't want to be in that state at all times. That's, that's, that's the fight or flight. That's the sympathetic nervous, nervous system, rah, 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 yang all the time. We need to be in this yin, this soft, receptive, relaxed place. Let the yang out when we need to, but return to the yin, stay in the yin. Hey, thanks for coming by and for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget you can support Whistlekick and our mission to connect, educate, and entertain by supporting us with the code podcast15 at whistlekick.com, joining our Patreon, or at the very least, check out what Jason Brick is doing with Safest Family on the Block. If you're not up for a book, I understand, but show him that we're supporting him and what he's doing. Subscribe to his podcast, download his podcast, follow him on social media, Safest Family on the Block, check out the book, use the code whistlekick23, get yourself 25% off that awesome, awesome book that he put a tremendous amount of time into. I want to thank Sensei Aaron for coming on the show. I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. I certainly did. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick Everywhere. My email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.